Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to One Civil Law. I hope you're having a great day, and we are here with a second stream. The Centers for Disease Control has just come up with a new regulation, which is being published in the Federal Register on Friday, in which the federal government, the Center for Disease Control, purports to have the authority to stop all evictions for people who are renting in the United States as part of disease control. Now, I've taken a very brief look at this, and I've taken a very brief look at the relevant statutes that they cite, and I do not believe that this order is legal. I believe that this is an illegal order. I don't even think it passes the laugh test. I, I just don't think that the CDC has the relevant legal authority to do any of the things that they're purporting to try to do. So let's just look over the relevant statutes and look over the relevant language, and I'll tell you why I've come to this conclusion that I think that what the federal government is trying to do is very super illegal in this case, at least given the authority that they've cited. There might be other authority somewhere else, but this was the best that they've come up with so far, and I'm assuming there's no better because I'm assuming the best they, they, can, they, that they could find. Okay, so this is gonna be published in the Federal Register on Friday. The Federal Register is the journal of the federal government. It publishes all the regulations and findings from all the agencies. It's published every single day. And this is a draft. It's a draft, but it's a final rule that's being published on Friday. And this is an agency order from the agency is the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Department of Health and Human Services. Summary. All right. We're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read some operative provisions. So I'll just read the summary, and then I'm going to skip a whole bunch of pages, and then I'm going to read some other stuff, and we'll get to the statute, okay? Because the whole thing is like 50 pages long. It goes through, or 30 pages long. It goes through a history of the disease. It goes through a history of the spread of the disease. You know, it goes through a lot of the biological realities of the disease which you probably already know, we don't need to cover all that stuff. We're here to discuss the operative legal issues. We are taking as a given that COVID is a, is a communicable disease that poses a risk. And we'll even take as a given that would be good for people not to be evicted, which seems like a, which seems like a plausible position. But here's what the Center for Disease Control is trying to do. The Center for Disease Control, which is located within the Department of Health and Human Services, that's just a very fancy administrative thing. So CDC reports to HHS is what that says. Announces the issuance of an order under Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act to temporarily halt residential evictions to prevent further spread of COVID-19. And this order is effective insert date of publication, which will be this Friday, because that's the scheduled day, through December the 31st of 2020. All right. So it's not in effect yet, but it will be in effect on Friday. All right. So then there's a whole bunch of background. There's a whole bunch of how it would apply, more background, the disease is bad, some definitions. Um, there's some interesting definitions here. Okay, so, so in terms of definitions, it's just an interesting thing to note. The individual has used all best efforts to obtain all governmental assistance. So this would only, this, this is who it applies to. Individuals, this applies to. It applies to individuals who have use best efforts to obtain all governmental assistance for renting and housing. The individual either expects to earn no more than $99,000 in annual income or no more than $198,000 of following jointly, was or was not required to report any income in 2019 or received an economic impact payment. So apparently if you make more than $99,000 a year, you can still be evicted. So I don't even know how the logic of this works. Like if you have more money, then you can still be evicted, but if you have less money, you can't be evicted. I don't quite understand how the logic of that works. Like, if we're going to say that there's a public health reason for people not to be homeless, then why does that become less important if you make more than ninety nine thousand dollars? I don't know, but there's a clap, there's a cap there, so you have to have earned no more than ninety nine thousand dollars. The individual is unable to pay rent or make full housing payment due to loss of work or other situation. They're using the best, best efforts to make partially partial payments. They're as close to full payment as maybe. So you're supposed to still make your best effort at making full payment or as close to it as possible. So good luck with that. An eviction would likely render the individual homeless or force the individual to move into and live to close quarters in some sort of shared setting because they have no other housing, av housing available. Which... I suppose a court can try to adjudicate that. So that makes a new thing for a court to be able to adjudicate. 
Eviction means what you think it would mean. Residential property means what you think it means. State means what you think it means, including D.C. On U.S. territory, interestingly, um, it defines it here to include American Samoa, but then it later takes it away because there apparently have been no COVID cases in American Samoa. So all the people who are living in American Samoa, this does not apparently apply to you. Okay. Statement, background, applicability. It basically says that if there's a state order that is more beneficial than this, then the state order still wins. So this is like minimum level coverage. So, and that says, yeah, there's no, this does not apply to American Samoa because there are no cases. So if you're in American Samoa, no matter how much rent you pay or don't pay, I, you're on your own, I guess. So if you're in American Samoa out there, it doesn't apply to you. And here it talks about evicted renters much move, which leads to multiple places they have to live. Uh, yeah, evicted, that's a deep thought. Evicted renters have to move. Wow, deep, yeah. Shared housing is not limited to family friends, includes other people, Congress passed some relief, blah, blah, blah. Evicted individuals, blah, blah, blah. This is all just like background, justification, rationale, right? Okay, so now let's get to the actual like legal findings on page 26. Now that we've gone through some definitions, some background, here's how COVID works, here's how the spread works, here's why it would be bad if people were homeless, et cetera, and so forth. Let's get to the actual legal operative effect of this thing. Okay, findings in action. Therefore, I, which presumably is the head of the CDC, which we'll get to that in a minute. Therefore, I have determined the temporary halt and evictions in this order constitutes a reasonably necessary measure under, take note here, 42 CFR 70.2. We'll get back to that in a second, right? That's that's legal authority. I, I know how to look that up. I know how to look up a 42 CFR 70.2. We can look that up and discuss it. We will look it up and discuss it. So this is a necessary measure under 42 CFR 70.2. Okay. To prevent further spread of COVID throughout the United States, I further determined that measures by states, localities, or U.S. territories that do not meet or exceed the minimum protections are insufficient to prevent interstate spread of COVID. Fine. Based on the convergence of COVID-19, seasonal influenza, and increased risk of individual sheltering in close quarters and congregate settings, such as homeless shelters, which may be unable to provide adequate social distancing as populations increase, all of which may be exasperated as fall and winter approach, I have determined a temporary halt on evictions through December the 31st, 2020, subject to further extension, modification, or rescission as appropriate. Okay, that would be like our motive for doing it, but the legal basis is a whole other problem. Therefore, again, take note, Therefore, subject, therefore, under 42 CFR 70.2, subject to limitations under the applicability section, which we discussed above, which dealt with, like, they have to pay the most they can, and they have to have certain income and so forth. So we, we read some of that before. Um, so subject to those limitations, a landlord, owner of residential property, or other person with legal right to pursue eviction of property shall not evict any covert, covered person from any residential property in any state or U.S. territory in which there's documented cases of COVID-19 that provides a level of public health protections below the requirements in this order. And then it goes on to say this order is not a order within the meaning of the APA, which says you can't sue us. And yes, we absolutely can. And if it is a rule, no sin procedures delay because we have really special reasons and blah, blah, blah. Considering the public health emergency, we have really important reasons, which probably would work if this was a valid rule, but it's not. A delay in the effective date of this order would permit the occurrence of evictions on a mass scale that could have prevent significant consequences. Finally, the rule covers as a rule, then they've determined to be a major rule, but that would not delay an effective date. So yeah, then the Congressional Review Act. If any portion of this order is invalid, other provisions remain invalid. And then this order shall be ex extended to these, these various things. And then it puts on criminal penalties. It puts on criminal penalties if you're a landlord and want to evict people. Very super exciting. All right. So here are some criminal penalties for you trying to evict this. Uh, if you evict someone under 18 USC 3559, 3571, 42 USC 271 and 42 CFR 70.1A. And we can go look up all those things and we might do that very well because I didn't load those statutes in advance. I only loaded the, the stuff they cited. They cited a Remember in the introduction, they cited a particular chapter of the health code. I loaded that and they cited the CFR. I loaded that for their authorities. So we'll get to we'll get to that and then maybe we'll analyze the penalties. A person violating this order, which presumably is a landlord who tries to evict someone, 
may be subject to a fine of not more than $100,000 if the violation does not result in death, or one year in jail, or both, or a fine of no more than $250 if the violation results in death, or one year in jail, or both, as otherwise provided by law. An organization violating this law, law order, which presumably would be like a landlord-tenant organization or something, may be fined no more than $200,000 per event if the violation does not result in death, or $500,000 per event if the violation results in death or otherwise protected by law. Uh, 99, 999 from Ghost Recon. Here's for great content. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. And then uh, then it goes to cite under 42 USC 243, the U.S. Department of Health uh, is authorized to cooperate with state legal authorities. So if you want our help, we can cooperate with you and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. So they cited two provisions of law that they say give you the authority to do this. So we're going to read them together. And I'm going to explain to you why the, 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 the things they cite do not give them the authority they do. All right. So the, so I need to show you basically where they cite both these things so that you know that I'm not like just make pulling this up out of my butt. Not that you would probably anyway. Um, but the first thing that they cite is Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act. All right. So that is a code number and it has been codified in a different place. So the first thing we want to look up is Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act. Well, that is now codified at 42 USC 264, Regulations to Control Communicable Diseases. This is this is the act in question. Um, I think you can even see that because, the, yeah, because here, uh, back, go back here. I can even show you it's true. So they say, say, say how, see, it says here how it's under Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act, right? If you go to this, if you go to this statute and you go to the very bottom of it, you see what it says? It says July 1st, 1944, Section 361. Section 361. So that's the same 361. So that's just pointing out like the different statutes that have impacted this. So when it's saying Section 361 of the Public Health Act, that's that Section 361. So this is Section 361. It's just now exists in a different place, which is to say 42 USC 264, because it's been codified. All right, and here's what it says. Section A, the Surgeon General, with approval of the Secretary, and here it means Health and Human Services, I'm pretty sure. Yes, it means Health and Human Services. So the Surgeon General, with authority of the Secretary, was so presume problem A, this may come from the wrong person. But that's not the biggest issue. The Surgeon General, with the approval of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, is authorized to make and enforce such regulations as, in his judgment, are necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from current foreign countries into the states or possessions, or from one state or possession into any other state or possession. Okay, great. So you can prevent these diseases from coming into the United States, and you can prevent them from transferring over states. All right. Then it goes on to say, and this is the part, as legal legal would want to say, we want to think like a lawyer. For the purposes of carrying out and enforcing such regulations, the Surgeon General may provide for such inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, destruction of animals or articles found to be so infected or contaminated as sources of dangerous infection to human beings and other measures as in his judgment may be necessary. Okay. So we had a whole bunch of language there. And I want to get this right. So I'm going to look up this term in Latin just to make sure that I get it right because I don't want to um, use the wrong terminology. Um, but there's a there's a general principle where you want to read things in 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 in, in the same class. It's Estium, estium generis. Sem generis is a statutory construction or a principle of construction. All right, so and that means of the same class or nature. So this is a canon of construction, a well-worn tool that lawyers use when they're trying to interpret a statute. Okay, and so here is here's the rule. So when you don't know what to do, here's how you interpret a statute or one way of interpreting a statute. So you can follow Sem generis. Here's what it is: when a list of two or more specific descriptors is followed by a more specific general descriptor. The otherwise me wide meaning of the general descriptor must be restricted to the same class, if any, of the specific words that precede them. For example, where, quote, cars and the list of things includes and other stuff, 
the other stuff is interpreted to be the same class or same nature as the things that were listed. So if you say a class of that nature, and so therefore it would be unreasonable to interpret it to mean an airplane, right? So that's how you, and that's one of the ways you do this is from these, these rules of statutory construction. All right, so we can go back to the statute and let's do that together. Let's interpret the language by looking at the class of things. And then when it talks about and other stuff, let's figure out if and other stuff can reasonably be included as in order to prevent, as in order to stop people from evicting. So we're looking for authority to stop evictions. We definitely didn't see it in one of the listed items, did we? No, we didn't see it in one of the listed items. So it must mean, it must be and in other stuff. So let's see if, if see if stopping evictions is sufficiently like the other stuff to be part of the same class. Let's give that a try. Okay. We have inspection. We have fumigation. We have disinfection. We have sanitation. We have pest extermination. We have destruction of animals and we have destruction of articles and other measures. Okay. Law chat is is in order to stop people from evicting people like those specific examples such that it can be thought of as part of the same class of things is evicting people from their homes in the same class as inspecting fumigating disinfecting sanitizing pest extermination destruction of animals or destruction of articles is is evicting people like any of those things I'll give you a second to think about it. This is not a trick question. Yeah. So, no, you, you can't do that. Yeah. All right. So let's give the CFR a try. Remember they cited that CFR provision a couple times? 42 CFR 70.2. You remember that one? You remember that section? Let's give the see if the CFR gives it a try. Let's interpret that together. When the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, hey, that's definitely the guy we're talking about right now. When the director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention determines that measures taken by health authorities of any state or possession, including political subdivisions thereof, which is a very fancy way of saying counties or cities, are insufficient to prevent the spread of any communicable disease from such state or possession to any other state or possession. Okay, so if the CDC thinks that any state or any county or any city is not doing enough to prevent infection disease from spreading, then he or she may take such measures to prevent the spread of disease as he reasonably deems necessary, including, oh, it's a list again, Inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, and destruction of animals or destruction of articles believed to be the source of infection. Okay, so now the generic language, now the generic language is front loaded. Now the generic language is measures deemed reasonably necessary. So it is, the other stuff is front loaded in the list. But now we sell, so we say reasonably measures, including. So we know we have a set, right? We know we have a set because it includes these specific items that we just delineated, right? So we know it includes these specific things. So is, is eviction similar to inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, and destruction of animals or destruction of articles? Is eviction like any of those things? Is it reasonable? is what is reasonably necessary, which includes those list of things, which are all, I would argue, of a same class and same nature. Is eviction anywhere even vaguely in the same ballpark as any of those things? Could you go to court with a straight face and say, your honor, my authority to evict is implied because it's similar to one or more of these things. It's in the same class of goods. No, I don't think so. Two dollars from Joseph Mead or Joe's Mead. Will the landlords have standing to sue? Hell yes. And they're going to win. 
The CDC can't do this. It doesn't make any logical sense. It doesn't make any logical sense at all because it doesn't fit within any of the specific items and it's not within the, gr the group of items. You know? And we can't read it. We can't read it unlimitedly open, right? Because if it were any measures reasonably necessary, well, we've just turned them basically into a czar and we're not going to do that. So it has to be constrained. He can inspect things. He can fumigate things. He can disinfect things. He can sanitize things. He can exterminate pests. He can exterminate animals. And he can destroy items that he believes are disease carriers. That all seems pretty reasonable. That all seems like something that the director of the CDC could do. Uh, your, your entire plant is, is a germ-infested factory. I'm going to burn it to the ground. That would work. I mean, it's an item, right? So, I mean, you you want to you want to burn the disease infected plant to the ground? I guess you can do that. That's the destruction of an article. You know, this this car has the coronavirus. I'm going to smash it up. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to lie solid until it until it soaks until it starts flowing until it flows like rivers. That all seems fine. You know what is not one of these things? Preventing people from infecting other people. You know, it's like, that is just, no, it can't, no, that doesn't make any logical sense at all. None of these things, none of these things, none of these things. So I have, I have read the relevant statutes and I've read the relevant CFR, which they cited to me because, you know, that was very kind. And then they have this wonderful thing here, right here under, yeah, they even cite it here under, under section 361, otherwise known 42 USC 264 and 42 CFR 70.2, which is what we just read. We just read that. We just read those things. It is not in anywhere any of those things. So I don't know how the CDC or their lawyers thinks that they can get away with any of this because this does not make any sense. This this does not make any sense. It, 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 even, even Chevron, Hour, and Brand X do not go this far in this lawyer's humble opinion. I know we can stretch the bounds beyond all that is reasonable, and God knows that I think our Brand X and Chevron go way too far. And if this is your first time hearing about that and you're like, what's a Chevron, what's a Brand X, and what's an hour? Don't ask. We will be here for the next five hours. But even under all that authority, which is pretty expansive, East lawyer does not think it gets you to the ability to just to, to stretch the bounds that far. That's a lot of stretch, man. That is a whole lot of stretch. I'm not buying it. No. All right. So then they then they threatened us with some criminal penalties. Uh. So let's let's look up some criminal statutes because you know we're bored. Let's look up uh let's look up some statutes. See what we got here. 18 USC, three five five nine. This is just the general criminal statute. It just says, by the way, here's all the crimes that kind of exist. Here's the various classifications for it. That's super exciting. Thank you for letting me know that. Here's what a first degree felony is. Here's what a second degree felony is. Here's what a third degree felony is. Okay, I'm, that's that's super helpful. Uh, let's see, 35, 71. Fines. Okay, 71 just defines what fines are. I'd like to take your money. That's great. All right, 42 USC 243, isn't that what we just read? Uh, grant of authority and cooperation. Uh, the secretary is authorized to accept help from the state and local authorities. The secretary shall encourage cooperation, authorized to develop actions to in engage cooperation. So the secretary is allowed to play nice with others. That's nice. It's nice to know the secretary is allowed to play nice with others. Uh, 264. 268. Quarantine duties of counselor. Any counselor or medical officer designated for such purpose shall make reports, shall be a duty to aid and no, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So that's great. I don't care. 271. What does 271 have to teach me that I don't really care about? I'm sure either. Uh, penalties for violation of quarantine laws. Yeah, that, so you can be charged with this various penalties and it also looks like they're charging you more penalties than the statute allows for. Who dreamed this up in the Trump administration? 
Who, who, who in the office of general counsel of the CDC signed off on this? That's the question I want to know right now. Oh, uh, and then we just define like what communicable diseases are and what director means and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. And what interstate traffic is like you didn't already know that. Okay. Criminal penalties. Uh, 42 USC 70.18. What does that have to teach me? Does it teach me anything that I care about? Uh, violations are $100,000. So that's where he comes up with the $100,000 part for the interstate quarantine. Um... Of course, he has to have the authority to do it in the first place, which it isn't within the statute that he cited, maybe somewhere else, but not within the statute they cited, not that way, because I can read. And we have the ability to cooperate, availability of federal resources, blah, 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 blah. Effective date is on Friday, uh, which is the date of publication. Then you have to sign some things under penalty of perjury. The authority, and then they say it again. The authority for this is 42 USC 264, and 42. This 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 doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. That's not the way laws work, man. That's not the way laws work, man. This this pisses me off. This pisses me off. This statute and this authority is nowhere close to anything that would enable this. But, but watch some federal judge who, who likes quarantines sign off on it anyway. Watch, watch a federal judge sign off on it anyway and say this is a valid order. I, you know, Two dollars from Boomhauer. Dang you all to everyone. Hope all is well. Yeah. Two dollars nine ninety nine from Ghost Recon. Here comes great content. Thanks. Two dollars from Joe's Mead. Said landlords have threat sending this too. Oh yeah. Five dollars from Newbie. Everyone like and share this with anyone who owns property. Yeah. What well, if the CDC issued a quarantine order? Well, then that would be a completely different action then, wouldn't it, Matt? If they issued a quarantine order, they'd be issuing under a different legal authority. What what if what if the le what if the factual and legal posture was completely different than it was now? Well, I don't know, Matt. If the factual and legal posture was completely different than it was now, then we'd be making a completely different legal analysis. What if we weren't talking about evictions? What if we were talking about the inspection of meat? And what if it wasn't the CDC? What if it was the USDA? Would it be legal then? What if we were talking about procedures dealing with cleaning out airplanes and it was a regulation issued by the FAA? Ooh, maybe that would be a good thing. Yeah, maybe if we completely change the factual and legal predicate, the legal analysis would change. Deep. Wow. Jesus. What, what if... What if we were being attacked by a foreign country and the U.S. military responded? Would that be legal? <sighs> Anyways, I don't think this is legal. I don't think this is legal under the authority that's there. Yeah, $2 from JJ. Wow, talk about uncivil law. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know, this, this law is not in accordance with the, the law. It does not have the authority under the either. It doesn't, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do in this order does not match up with either the statute they cited or the CFR. It is not there and it cannot be reasonably read to be there. Yeah, maybe if they were doing something else completely different, maybe that would be legal. Wow. So yeah, maybe if they issue a different order under a different authority, we'll have to have a stream about whether or not that's legal. So anyways... I'm going to end the stream before I get too much more irritated. Yeah, just just tell your landlord friends, tell your landlord friends, official disclaimer, this is not legal advice to you specifically. Consult your own lawyer. Have them have them actually read the statute because I think it's crap.
I don't think that they have the authority to do what they're trying to do. Consult your own lawyer before you go ahead is always good advice. But yeah, I would I if it were if it were if it were me, I wouldn't feel bad about filing the eviction and and fighting the feds because this seems like completely off base. So, I mean, you can't just say, oh, we have a moratorium on on evictions with no legal authority. Not to mention for the least of reasons or the or the most of reasons that like landlord tenant is pretty firmly within the bounds of state law. So like what landlord tenant relationships are and renting relationships, that's pretty firmly inside state level law. Right. You don't talk about landlord tenant on a federal level unless, you know, the federal government is your landlord or something. But short of that. You know, landlord tenants done at the local level. It's not even usually done at the state level. You know, landlord tenants usually done at the county and city level. So it is like not even in the federal domain. And their authority doesn't speak to anything like this. So I don't know. I don't know where the federal government gets gets off. This one really pisses me off. You know, I've, I've read a lot of orders from Trump and the Trump administration, and We've given them fair analysis, and some of them I thought are good, some of them are bad, and some of them I thought were questionable. I, I do not believe I have ever read a, an executive order from the Trump administration in any context that is as dubious as this. This may be the single weakest legally executive order I've ever seen in my life. The travel ban stuff and stuff dealing with, even the stuff dealing with um, trying to prevent people from claiming asylum if they didn't claim asylum in another country, which I ultimately agreed with the Ninth Circuit on their legal analysis that that was an invalid EO because of the specific statute in place. Even there, the Trump administration had more to work with than this. I mean, it was ultimately a wrong argument for Trump, but at least there they had something to hang their hat on. And here they have nothing. This is by far and away the weakest executive order or I've ever seen in my in, in this current administration. So I don't know who in the office of general counsel at the CDC signed off on this, but that person should be ashamed of themselves because you are trying to twist the law beyond all pretzel logic. Even, even in my grandest schemes of legal conniptions where I tried to manipulate the law into in, into manifestations just for the entertainment value of trying to figure out what is possible. You have gone beyond anything I could even dream of. This is a travesty. I hate this crap. <sighs> Tony says it's an optics thing. It ain't about the law. Well, you know what? They published it like it is a law. They published it in the Federal Register. They, they, they called it a law. The Federal Register is law. I mean, it's an, it's an order for, it's law. It's part of the executive agency. Whether it's for optics or not, I can't, I mean, if it were a series of recommendations, that'd be fine. They can recommend anything they want. But they're trying to put this as an order with criminal penalties. They can, they can, they just, they just get bent, man. You know, they can get absolutely bent. I've seen some weak orders from the Trump administration but I I don't know that I've ever seen an order where I couldn't at least make a halfway plausible or or backward engineered rationale, and I can't do anything here, man. This is just messed up. So if if a person came to me as a client, I'd tell them to ignore this. So that would be great. Watching you daily says each state has their own landlord tenant act. Yes. Now the feds have control over HUD apartments. If you're thinking about um apartments where they're providing funding and financing uh like title what's it called title like eight housing or section eight section eight housing was what i was working for section eight i know it was one of those things if you're thinking about section eight housing then maybe but we'd probably be talking about something under how we'd be talking more about housing and urban development authority rather than hhs so if if housing and urban development has some sort of power within their scheme, then we'd be talking about housing and urban development, which is a different which is a different department uh, than HHS. But if you're thinking Section 8 housing and maybe there's something there, yeah, but we'd probably be doing it under completely different legal authorities. Yamo Yamamoto says, so you respectfully dissent? No, I dissent. 
I just sent. This is crap. If you liked this stream, I'd appreciate it if you'd be so kind as to give it a like. Please join my Discord. And if you've not already done so, please become a member of the channel. For 99 cents, you too can become a member by pressing the join button. It will help me bring in revenue and help the channel grow. I'm now going to see how much alcohol it takes until I pass out. I hope you've had a good day. Cheers and good night.